Hello, and welcome to this executive briefing on healthcare information security. I'm Jennifer Findlay with the Kansas Hospital Association, and I'll be the moderator for today's discussion. Today I will be joined by Dennis Frank, CEO of Neosho Memorial Regional Medical Center in Chinook, Kansas, and information security consultant Tom Walsh, who's based out of the Kansas City area. We'll try to schedule cover several important topics in a short time frame during today's discussion, including lessons learned from an OCR audit, types of audits, common audit findings, common risks and reported breaches, and C-level involvement. We'd like to start off the discussion with some comments from Dennis Franks. Dennis, it's my understanding that your facility was recently selected for a random HIPAA privacy and security audit by the Office of Civil Rights. Could you please share with our listeners a little bit about that experience? Yes, Jennifer, thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, just a little bit about us. Uh, Neosho Memorial Regional Medical Center uh, is a uh, critical access uh, facility located in the southeast part of Kansas. Um, we were one of the 115 hospitals selected for a random HIPAA audit from the Office of Civil Rights last year. The notice arrived via regular mail uh, to our risk manager. When the audits were initially announced, we believed that as a critical access hospital in Kansas, we wouldn't be selected. We were wrong. In advance of their visit to our hospital, uh, the auditors requested an extensive list of documents. Uh, the request included general information about the facility and a lengthy list of HIPAA and private, uh, privacy secure and security, security policies. There was not a lot of time to prepare any of this uh, for their arrival, but my staff, my staff and I spent a lot of time in the review of our HIPAA policies. I don't know when you last looked at your HIPAA, pol your HIPAA policies, but I want to stress the importance of periodic review here. Uh, we were asked for policies and screenshots uh, as of the prescribed cutoff date that they had made. So there was really uh, no opportunity to create any new policies or to revise our current policies prior to the submission. Because of this, it's, a, it's very important to make sure that your facility is ready all the time. Ten days after our initial contact with the uh, OCR, uh, we had three inspectors here from various geographic locations across the United States for, very, uh, for a very long three-day period. The process was very much like an inspection from the state or joint commission, and it was just as important. The consequences are very high, and a lot is at stake. Even though uh, they were here uh, for a random audit, there was a very real potential for an expanded audit if they found anything wrong. Uh, the audit process was very thorough. Our IT director and privacy officer were de had dedicated themselves to the auditors for the entire time that they were here. Fortunately for us, uh, when the auditors were finished, um, they found no substantial issues or concerns uh, with our HIPAA privacy and security compliance. The audit was uh, conducted in July and we're still awaiting a final report, July of last year. I encourage you to pay attention uh, to this presentation uh, and as the CEO of your organization, I do understand and, and try to understand better actually uh, what your responsibility and role is in uh, the uh, HIT security. Thank you very much for your time. Dennis, thanks so much for sharing with us a little bit about your experience. Tom, I'll now turn to you. Um, based upon what Dennis said, is there anything else that you'd like to add um, regarding the types of audits that are currently being conducted and some of the common findings that we're seeing coming out of those audits? Yes, I would. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, to clarify, there are three types of possible audits that a covered entity could expect from the Office for Civil Rights. And the first one, which has always been in place, and that is some type of an investigation after a reported breach or a patient complaint. Now, these types of audits are very focused and they usually stay only within the parameters of whatever the complaint or the breach would be. 
The second type is what Dennis referred to that his organization experienced, and that's one of these random audits. Dennis mentioned there were 115 of those conducted through the 2012 year. Uh, we don't know for sure how many are going to be conducted over the next two years, but we do know that the Office for Civil Rights has been funded to continue audits through 2014. Now the third type of audit that many of you may not be aware of, and that is uh, meaningful use audits. So any covered entity that received money, incentive money, for in implementing a certified electronic health record or certified uh, electronic medical record and then met those core objectives uh, for meaningful use could be audited. And one of the areas that you could expect to be audited on is one of the core measures and that's risk analysis. Last year in March of, of 2012, Linda Sanchez from the Office for Civil Rights presented this slide where she was showing where the common findings were in the um, audits that had been conducted so far. So number one, you could see uh, user activity monitoring, and that's audits, meaning auditing what your users are doing when they're in the uh, electronic health record or the electronic medical record. And then I wanted to point out that the, one of the other findings, which you can see I've circled there, is uh, conduct a risk assessment. And this has been a requirement since 2003 when the security rule first came out with a compliance deadline of no later than April 21st, 2005. So it is a bit of an uh, interesting thing to see here that here we are so many years later, you know, eight years later, and still some organizations are struggling with conducting a risk analysis. In 2008 and 2009, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services contact, conducted their own, well, through the CMS, they conducted their own audits to see what was going on. And again, one of the common findings they had from the audits they conducted back then was a risk assessment. So it is a pretty common finding, uh, Jennifer, and, and something that organizations need to address. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, you know, besides audits, what do you think is the other greatest threat affecting healthcare information technology? Well, Jennifer, I like to look at the reported breaches. The, these are the, report, the breaches that have affected more than 500 patients. And you can find this information on the Department of Health and Human Services website. And what I have here is the most recent report that I created, which was at the end of December. And the pie chart shows us where the areas of risk are for organizations. And you can see that theft and loss make up a good portion. That's 68% you know, of everything that's being reported. And you have to ask yourselves, what's being lost, what's being stolen? And it's mobile devices, portable media, such as USB drives, backup tapes, and you know a lot of these could be addressed if we just simply implemented encryption and encrypt the data at rest. And, and then this is becoming so important that for stage two meaningful use, it is one of the core objectives that we have to assess the risk for data at rest and whether or not we're encrypting it. One other area, and you can see I've highlighted in a yellow box here at the bottom of the slide, and that is keep in mind 20% of all the reported breaches were caused by business associates. And the concern here is that these business associates are not covered by your cyber insurance policy, and while it's 20% of the breaches, they've affected close to 70% of the uh, affected patients' lives when you count the total number of patients affected by all breaches combined. So I would say, Jennifer, the areas we nearly need to put some effort in for risk and risk reduction would be uh, portable devices, um, mobile devices, portable media, as well as our business associates. Okay, Tom. So you've obviously pointed out there's a lot of risk out there. We have to worry about audits. Bottom line, what are your recommend recommendations for C-level executives? What should they be doing to make sure their organizations are protected and ready? 
Yes, ma'am. And a lot of this was already addressed with what Dennis said. And, you know, if you're not going to listen to a, a, a CEO who been, who's been there and done this, I don't know if I can add a lot more to it. But I will say this. For the organization, you have to determine your risk tolerance. You've got to decide how risk will be handled. You're not going to be able to fix everything. No one expects you to fix everything. There's no such thing as 100% security. But you really need to know where your areas of high risk or moderate risk are, and then what are you going to do with it. And that's where you sign off on your risk analysis reports. Many times organizations will conduct the analysis but fail to do the very last step, and that's to get their executives to sign off on it. As executives, you want to also be aware of what's going on with your privacy and security initiatives. Many of these audits, whether they're random, investigative, uh, will involve C-level. And C-level executives need to know what the program is and what it's about. You don't want to wait till the auditors show up to start your education and awareness about information security or your privacy program. Of course, at an executive level, one of the responsibilities or duty is to make sure the organization is doing its due diligence. And that means sometimes you have to put accountability and oversight into your information security and privacy programs. And I would recommend that you also give a report to your board on an annual basis as to where your um, organization is with privacy and security. Some of these initiatives will require some capital investment. If they understand what the regulations are and what the risks are, your board may be more willing to accept some of those uh, capital expenditures. All right. Well, um, Dennis and uh, Tom, I appreciate you guys taking time to share some information with our members today. I did want to let everyone know that is listening that we have a number of resources available here at KHA to help you as you and your staff sit down to talk about um, evaluating your risks and starting to prepare for some of these audits and other things that are on the horizon. And we've put a couple of those um, resources available up here on this slide that you're looking at right now and included some direct links to them. You can also go to the hithelp.org page on our website uh, and that will have a wealth of resources related to health information technology um, that will help you as you move through this process. Uh, I want to thank everyone for listening to this executive briefing today. Um, and I, again, want to thank Tom and, and, and Dennis for spending some time with us. Hopefully you found this information helpful, and it will st start you down your journey of making sure you're prepared. Have a great day. <laughs>